the first thing I wanted to say is thank you ever so much for coming and being part of Vivid Live at the Opera House again. Thanks for having us. It's an immense honour. Well, it's lovely to be back and um, always in, very special to play here. Yes. Well, it's an interesting performance, this one. Here you are for Vivid at Robert Smith's request, playing the 25th anniversary of, of Dirty Three. Uh, how, how does it feel to have sort of another person invite you to look back on your past and, and bring it into the present? I personally didn't realise it was that long ago, and then when that was pointed out, it's a, I mean, I don't really think back in that respect with things. It's, I prefer to just think of momentum going forward. It's kind of great, though, that people remember it 25 years later. And for Robert Smith to remember it was particularly awesome because he's, he's so awesome. Well, one of the things I found interesting about the 25th anniversary and, and from reading past interviews pretty much with all of you was this sense that you don't make the Dirty Three's music for your listening pleasure. You, you make it for the making pleasure. With this record, I didn't even want to listen to it because I was so amazed that we'd made a record. We just played through our set that we had. We all went out and got really hammered the night before and to see you too because our friends were supporting them. I slept on the veranda of my brother's house and I don't know where Jim ended up. But we, we got just rat ass drunk and then went into the studio and had half a day lost, I think, because we were so hungover. I think over. about the studio, that's what I, I think about that house. Yeah, everyone was really <laughs> sick and we just sat up and Phil had just done Silverchair tomorrow. Right. He just recorded that. And um, so we were trying to catch the zeitgeist of Silverchair's momentum and we figured that <laughs> we could do that. We could do that. <laughs> We could do that with a bunch of snappy, snappy, um, <laughs> snappy kind Pop of songs. numbers. I love Silverchair, by the way. So we got Phil in, and um, I think we recorded in the evening and the next day, and then Phil mixed it that evening. It was done literally. It's just all done live. Yeah, it's all done live. It is our live set at, at the time, and we played it like it. We were playing a live set. The album sounds like still a very dramatic, consistent statement of intent. It, well, it is very disciplined in a way, you know, it's, it's straight, it's clear what we're trying to do. And it comes through more than I would, you know, I was happy with how much it comes through on the record. Trying to make these, these sort of songs exist without a lyrical basis, to make them narrative, to make some sort of thing going on. It always felt like there was, the, there was some story being told. With, with the music. One of the big things about Dirty Three, it was about, I guess in a way, trying to kind of like, the, the good and the bad side of love. And love is a radical concept. Broken hearts and kind of, what I remember the first time I spoke on stage was describing my day. And people would just pissed themselves laughing. And, and I told the truth. It was like my girlfriend tried to kill herself. She'd been banging up in her hand, blah, 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 like this. And everybody started laughing and I real and it was funny. It was actually funny. Like good comedy. Good comedy is it's real. Truth. Yeah, it's the truth. There's an inherent sort of dramatic tension and kind of oppositional yeah, that, forces. That's what we worked on, definitely. That that was the way we kinda of operated. Um, musical tension, interplay and to make it work without lyrics, I guess. But the lack of lyrics, I don't, I don't really buy that because it's like a lot of music I listen to it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to have lyrics to make it of, of substance or to make it doesn't, doesn't validate it anymore. I mean, let's give it a focus. So. Lyrics, yeah. But I can listen to a song in Greek, or Chinese, or whatever, and if it moves me, it moves me. I don't Classical really care. Music. And yeah. it's quite often the lyrics can put me off because I'm li listening to somebody's banging on about something that I don't really care about. So, you know, I, I, I kind of, I don't know. There's always, I think there's a sort of there's a, there's a night, wait, we sort of push it to another area, music without lyrics, and I don't really think it's appropriate. I think we had a lot of confidence in what we were doing. We never, we, we resisted, you know, getting people yeah, there singing and all no, that sort of stuff. No, there was never any discussion about that. And it was also the element of risk that was being taken was always so kind of fantastic, you know, to know that you'd pull up in a bar and there'd be five people and like three of them would want to fight you. <laughs> and the other two would just be like staring at you dumbfounded, but I mean, we got banned from Sydney. You'll never, yeah. some, uh, You'll never play this never town, play town again. Never play King Sellers again. <laughs> yeah.
whatever we, we had, we'd throw into the car. Someone, whoever hadn't lost their license or whoever hadn't lost their car for drink driving or something like that. And we'd just throw everything in the car and head down there, you know, pile of speed or something like that. Yeah, thanks for carrying the drunk around. Yeah, I carried the drunk <laughs> around for so fucking long. We were just like touring around the country and we sort of, I mean, we had this incredibly close bond, I, I think, like as friends and stuff like that. It was really like we were doing this thing that, just for ourselves, really, you know, that was kind of um, so exciting um, and, and kind of, you know, just made you feel alive. It feels very uncontrived and very pure and quite primal. And, and Well, we were just left alone, basically. We were left alone to do what we wanted to do. And somehow we just sort of, you know, for every band like us, there's, there's probably like a hundred that didn't get through. But we were just left alone and, you know, like and did what we did and, and just found our way through. But primarily off the support of a lot of great people. I've been very blessed to work with incredible people. Jim and Mick and Nick the Bad Seeds, like every person I've worked with has, has pushed me to do something that feels beyond my limits. And if, if I'm any good, it's because of the people around me. And I have acknowledged that from day one and I still acknowledge that. I wonder about um, being hard on, critical of your own work, and is there a sense of, of trust over time? I've always lived in fear of it all stopping. Um, pretty much, like I, every time I go in, it's like, is this the day it all stops? And when it, does, when it does happen that it does stop, you panic and then it makes you stronger and then you kind of go, okay. I, I just wake up every day and want to make something. And that's never gone away. It's always been the same, pretty much. I, I listen back to that record and I remember that time and I don't feel like I've changed that much. I think I'm probably a better guitar player now. <laughs> For me, I can draw a line pretty much through from day one until now. The way that I feel about getting something to a certain point where I feel like it's okay to let go and I have to feel that what I've done is the best thing that I've done, the best thing that I'm capable of, and it's the best thing that I have done. And that allows me to move forward. That's not about being kind on myself, it's, about, it's, it's a physical feeling that I know. And I, and I have to have that feeling about everything that I've ever worked on. And, it, and, and if I don't, then I, it, that's, my, that's my kind of compass. And it's when ideas start forming that I feel this shift that happens within me that I feel that something is happening for the greater good. And I, I really, I, I didn't know what that was for a long, long time. There might be an expression for it when you move to tears. Or like I have to feel like I'm falling in love with something and then I can let it go. And it's something that, that it's the only thing I have that I can rely on. That and the other people around me. I was reading kind of other interviews with yourselves where you, you've heard your music described as, as, as sad. Um, and, and I've always found Dirty Three's music very kind of joyous in a fierce, kind of alive, vital, primal way. Once you make it, it's, it's out of your hands, you know, like people will take it as they want, you know, like you want it to, you hopefully want it to be as, as honest as, as you can do. I mean, I think that's what we were always about, like, being honest, you know, like about what we were doing and not trying to make, if it was sad or dramatic music or whatever, it was just like all that we knew how to do really. And so we did that and every time we played a major chord, it just sounded wrong and we didn't really know what to do with it. So in a way, the vibrations found us too, you know, like there was a thing that we do, we play it and that would feel right and it would make the cog shift, you know. It's really extraordinary to think that people care about this record 25 years later. That's fantastic, you know, like that's, that's so kind of, um, it's a beautiful thing.